Psychoacoustics are when your acoustics are really crazy and out of control. They've gone a little psycho on you. No, that's not the case. Psychoacoustics are how our brain interprets sound that we hear in acoustical spaces. And so uh, I'm going to start following this diagram here uh, as we finish up these lectures on audio. And right here we have a dude uh, making a sound. And what is sound? What is sound? Frequency amplitude in what? In the air, right? Frequency amplitude of what? Waveforms. And what are waveforms representing? Of what? What is sound? That's what I'm trying to get to. What is sound? Frequency is a measurement of sound. Amplitude is a measurement of sound. What is it measuring? The vibration of particles. Can you tell me more? What are those particles doing in the air? They're pushing together, and we call that compression. And then what else? When we compress some of them, what happens? The other ones stretch out, right, and rarefy. So the sound is those compressions and rarefactions happening in the air, a disturbance in the air, if you will, right? So here is a little disturbance in the air that our, our dude is making, making a sound, okay? And that is acoustic energy, physical energy in the air. These sound waves are moving around. Those sound waves travel away from the disturbance, and they start banging into surfaces and walls. Uh, why? Because we spend lots of time inside walled areas, right? Uh, and how that sound interacts with the, the um, <clears throat> surfaces and boundaries, right? <laughs> if you need to get water for free, okay. Uh, how it interacts with those surfaces and boundaries is called acoustics, okay? We bound around there. And that's what I talked about on Monday. I talked about sound and I talked about acoustics, right? I talked about sound last week. What we are generally doing when we are talking about audio is that we want to capture this acoustic event and replicate it later, which means we have to convert it into electrical information. We do that generally through a thing called a microphone, which takes acoustic energy and converts it to electric energy. I'm going to talk about that today, too. Okay? Uh, that electric energy, now we often will convert from analog, which is what it is originally, into digital. And when we work uh, in, in digital audio workstations, this electrical information is now passed as ones and zeros rather than analogous looking waves of voltage. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. Once we're done working with it in the computer, we will usually send it out analog again to a speaker that will produce the sound and make it acoustic again. That sound will bounce around in a room and it will go into our ear. And how we hear that sound is called psychoacoustics. So we've talked about sound. I called it principles of audio. I'm going to change that to the principles of sound. We talked about basic acoustics. Today I'm going to talk about psychoacoustics and microphones. And then when we come back from Thanksgiving, I'm going to talk about analog audio, digital audio, and how we route that audio once it's in there. How we send it around. Questions? Make sense? OK. So first thing when we uh, are talking about uh, psychoacoustics, we have to understand the audio window. Can anyone tell me what the audio window is? Yeah, Kevin. Yes, and what would the two ranges be? What are the two axes on that range? And which one is x and which one is y? Okay, so we usually will draw like this. x-axis is frequency, y-axis amplitude. What's the plug-in that we use that looks the most like this? EQ, right? It's just like the EQ plug-in. Okay. Uh, our hearing range uh, in amplitude goes from 0 to 120 decibels. Okay. Uh, that is an extremely broad range. What this means here is if I had a zero, uh, it means a 10, uh, I'm sorry, it means a one with no zeros behind it. Does that make sense? 
just one. If I have 10 decibels, it means one with one zero behind it. If I have 20 decibels, how many zeros do you think are behind my one? Two. So 20 decibels would be a one with two zeros behind it. Does that make sense? OK. Brandon, can you give me, if I had 30 decibels, how many zeros would be behind my one? Three. Right? OK. So you're just taking this first number, and that's the number of zeros behind your one. Does that make sense? So when I get up to 120 decibels, how many zeros are behind my one? So one of the things to remember is decibel. So it really means 10 of those. So we kind of have to get rid of the 10 when we're looking at this. Okay. It's actually only, this is only two bells. Okay. We multiply by 10 and we get a decibel. So 120 would mean there are 12 zeros behind the 1. 1, ready for this? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. How much louder is 120 decibels than 0 decibels? You can tell me when they look at that. How much louder is 120 decibels than 10? No. Nope, 12 zeros, which is a little louder? A trillion times louder. We basically hear from 1 to a trillion. We write it as decibels because going from 1 to 120 is a lot easier than going from 1 to a trillion, right? It's like, that's kind of loud. That sounds like uh, 900,992,361 whatever, right, pascals or whatever it is. Instead, we could just say, ah, that sounds like 95 decibels. That's why we do that, okay? So the quietest sound we can hear is 0 decibels, which converts to 1. The loudest sound we can hear is 120 decibels, which converts basically to a trillion. We hear from 1 to a trillion. Okay. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. It's crazy, right? Yes, yes. And you can do, you can train your ear to identify how many decibels are. I can, I'm pretty good. I can usually get pretty close to it. Uh, and I think I showed you guys this the other day. This is called the Audio Tool. It has a little decibel meter pro in it. You should have this. You should totally have this on your, your phone. Uh, I press this and I know that we're at about 60 decibels right now, somewhere in that area. Right? And I was showing the class before. I can go here and go, ooh, and be around 70 decibels. It's actually better to watch, by the way, this needle up here rather than the number in the middle. Okay? So if I watch that, I'll get it at 70. Because that's showing RMS. You guys remember what RMS is? You need to know RMS. So write that down. What do you need to do? RMS versus peak. You've seen these, right? You've seen peak versus RMS? What's the difference between peak and RMS? Sounds like you'll be going back and looking at my lectures this week. R yeah, go ahead. Average. Perfect. RMS is the average level. Okay. So this is measuring peak here. This is jumping around on peak. RMS is saying over time how loud is it. Our ears hear RMS. Yep, peak is very momentary. Yep, that's the whole point. So if I go, ooh, I'm at about 70 decibels right here. Ooh. If I want to get to 80, I'm going to try to increase that sound. I got it up to 80. I don't think I can get up to 90. Nope, that's too loud for me. I think I probably just broke the, the microphone on that. 90 decibels. So. My mouth was six inches from this, the thing there, 90 decibels. OK. Uh, Brendan is, uh, let's say, uh, so half a foot. My mouth was half a foot from that. 
Brendan is six feet from me. How, how much quieter is it with him? How many times quieter is the sound of Brendan's ear? Okay, so half is, so remember, it's the inverse square law. You take the difference and you square it, okay? So how, many, how much further is he from my mouth than this phone was? This is half a foot, he is six feet. This is half a foot, he's six feet, how much further away is he from my mouth than the phone? Are you asking like actual footage? No, how many times further? 12. 12 times further, does that make sense? Because I have to multiply a half foot times 12 to get up to six feet. It's 12 times further away from me. So how many times quieter was the sound of Brandon's ear than this phone? Do you remember the inverse square law? No, no, we're in, we're, we are in amplitude right now. We are in decibels. We actually didn't, we didn't calculate any of this thing. No, it doesn't have anything, anything to do with what I'm, I've drawn because I'm trying to ask you something that we covered on Monday. Are these the things I'm going to ask you next week and on the final? Absolutely. So when I double the sound, Double the distance to a sound, how much quieter is it? No, quarter is loud. You have to square it. So how, how do I calculate that? If I say inverse square volume, 1 over the difference squared. Over the difference squared. So if someone is twice as far away from me, the, the sound will be one quarter as loud. Does that make sense? If, some, if, you are, if I make a sound and Irene is two feet from me and you are four feet from me, the sound will sound one fourth as loud because you are twice as far away from me as Irene. Every time you double the distance, the sound is one quarter as loud. If you are one foot from me and Jerry is two feet from me, how much quieter is it for Jerry? Four times, because he's twice as far away. You have to be thinking about that relationship of distance. Is it one time as far away, two times as far away, three times as far away? This is scary having my phone on a recording thing. Someone sends me something weird. When, like my wife. <laughs> there we go. She, she told me not to put that on my phone. Uh, if, did I get it off the screen? Yes. If something is, how much further away was he, Jalil, than the, the phone? 12. 12 times. How much quieter was it in Brennan's ear than the phone? If we have to take the difference and square it. Square it, not, not double it. Perfect. Good job, Brennan. You got it. That sound was 144 times quieter for him than it was for my phone. Craziness, right? Craziness. You are, what, 12 feet away. So this is now 24. You, it was tw the difference was 24, right? You are 24 times further away than my phone was, which means... That sounded loud, didn't it, to you guys? But really, for Jaleel, it was 24 squared times quieter than it was for my phone. We're talking huge differences in level. Huge differences in level, okay? We're extremely sensitive to it. It's amazing what our ears can do. You got it there. You nailed it when you said that, okay? Inverse square law. If someone is three times further away from you, how many times quieter is the sound? Nope, square that three. One ninth is loud. Or it's nine times louder for you, or one ninth is loud for them. If someone is four times as far away from you, how much quieter is it? 
Someone's four times further away from the sound source than you, how much quieter is it? Good, 16. Are we getting this? Yeah. If someone's 10 times further away from you, how much quieter is the sound? That's the inverse square law. If they are 27 times further away from you, how much quieter is it? Or you just say 27 squared. Inverse square law. We, I feel like you guys just got it there. Did we? Just got it there. Okay. So as, this, as you move away from the source, where Cyro was when I was making that loud noise, it was actually really quiet compared to what Brendan heard or my phone heard. Craziness, right? Okay. Uh, I'm going to come back and talk about frequency in just a second, okay? Because we are just so worked up about this amplitude thing, I want to keep going on it. We hear logarithmically. We hear from one to a trillion, basically. Uh, we use the word loudness to describe how, we, how loud we hear intensity uh, or pressure. Unfortunately, or fortunately, we use the word volume now quite a bit, too. And so I would say volume and loudness are starting to mean the same thing. Okay, even though scientifically volume doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, the biggest difference we can hear in a change in sound is about three decibels. If we're in a controlled environment like headphones, you can hear a one decibel change. But for the most part, if I take the fader and I moved it up three decibels in here and you had your eyes closed, most of you would not be able to hear it. I'm not going to do that right now, but we could later. Okay? That's the just noticeable difference. The point at which you can hear the level is different. Okay, so we're, our ears are really designed to hear these big changes in sound, not these subtle little ones. Okay, the extreme changes. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you're mixing something, and something sounds too loud, go ahead and start by moving it three decibels because that's the, the least amount anyone will be able to hear. If it's at a 12, drop it to a 15 or move it up to a nine. And see what happens. Okay, most people won't hear that. Don't bother changing things much less than one decibel. I've spent many years doing that. In fact, I just did it this weekend when I was mixing the wind ensemble. <gasps> okay, let me move from negative 19 decibels to negative 19.25. Oh yeah, that's better. Which means I'm really good at convincing myself I'm hearing things. Because I know if you A-B'd that for me, I wouldn't have been able to tell. But I sure felt like it was there. It's kind of like I'm talking about the compression, right? Now I feel better, even though no one in the mother can hear it. But I feel better. So. Uh, be real careful when you're getting there tweaking your levels and moving them that little amount. You're getting too far in, probably. Uh, three decibels means the sound is twice as loud. What? Get out of here. If you're at a party, And uh, too many people are coming up to you asking you for your phone number. Or they think they're, you're too cool and you really want to be left alone. You can tell them this joke. When is 40 plus 40? 40, 43. When you are talking decibels. But and then they'll leave you alone the rest of the night. Sound good? <laughs> You'll be very unpopular at the party. No one will think your joke's funny. If they do, you have a, uh, you, you will have found your soulmate, right? Oh, I got it, that's hilarious. Okay. What do I mean by that? Well, if you remember, uh, how many zeros do we have behind our one at 40 decibels? Four, so we'd have one, one, two, three, four. How many zeros do we have behind our, f our uh, other 40? Same thing, right? We end up with 20,000. That make sense? 10 to the x equals 20,000. Can anyone guess what that is? 10? Yeah. If you were to calculate that, it is 10 to the 4.3 equals 20,000. 
Try it on your calculator. Go ahead and put it in if you want. 10 to the 4.3. I'll even show it to you. How do you do these? And, and by the way, you don't need to know these specific things, but I'm just trying to... This is the joke, exactly. You want to know the joke. So if I go 10 and to the, exp to the exponent right here of 4.3, I end up with 20,000. Yes, rounding it a little bit. <laughs> rounding it. OK? Let's not get too particular here, folks. <laughs> and if you remember, this means that we are, that uh, if we want it to be a decibel, we have to multiply this by 10 to make it decibel, 10 bells, and we end up with 43. What does this mean? When you put two 40 decibel sounds together, and you add them together, you only end up with 43 decibels. You put two 43 decibel sounds together, you only end up with 46 decibels. Mm, that's weird, right? Two plus two, two plus two decibels plus two decibels would be 2.3 decibels. 10 decibels plus 10 decibels would be 13 decibels. Okay? A doubling of the sound is three, a three decibel difference. Doubling of the sound. Double of the intensity, sorry. We hear that as the smallest amount of change. The smallest amount of change. So when the sound gets twice as loud, we just barely notice it. Now the, the, the device is like freaking out. Like, wow, that sound just got a lot louder. And our ears like, oh, I just heard it change a little bit. Okay. So in the real world, when we move something up three decibels, Reality says that is two times louder. Our ears say that is just noticeable. Sorry. I can just hear that. When we increase something by 10 decibels, reality says that is 10 times louder. And our ears say that is twice as loud. We hear something that increases by 10 decibels is twice as loud. That's our, our perception of that, our psychoacoustic perception. Okay. 10 decibels we hear as twice as loud. Does that make sense? Unusual stuff, right? Not, mu not much of reality works like this. Actually, light, light does similarly, intensity and light. If you ever put on sunglasses that cut out half the light, it still looks pretty light. It still looks pretty light. Same thing, if I take the volume and I turn it down to half, it only went down three decibels. And you're like, that barely changed. And I'm like, that was half the volume. Right? So we don't hear linearly, we hear logarithmically like this. Logarithmically. What do I want you to take from that? I want you to know this. I want you to know the idea of this, that 120 decibels is a one with 12 zeros behind it, a trillion times louder than the quietest sound. I want you to know that we can just barely hear a three decibel change in the real world. If we're in a studio with headphones on, we can probably hear a one decibel change. Every three decibels is actually twice as loud, but we barely hear that movement. Every 10 decibels is 10 times as loud, but it sounds twice as loud to us. That's what I want you to know from that. Got it? Preston, you still there? We're not at 45 minutes. Okay, so if we go back to this audio window, the other thing we have in our audio window besides, besides amplitude is frequency right here. And what was our frequency hearing range? 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. And a hertz is a cycles per second those compression and rarefactions, right? Okay. So uh, what does that mean? Well, oddly enough, we hear amplitude logarithmically. We also hear frequency logarithmically. When we hear a sound that is I'm using up this whole pad today. 
When we hear a sound that is 100 hertz, uh, we tend to um, well, we we tend to like sounds that line up with that. And one of the first places that it lines up well is 200 hertz because it's twice as high. Does that make sense? In that scene, 100 hertz would look like this. 200 hertz, which I've shown you before, would go every two, right? And those anti nodes would line up. Okay, this is called an octave. Why? Because in Western music we divide it into eight steps often. Okay. We hear the change from 30 hertz to 60 hertz as an octave. We hear the change from 60 hertz to 120 hertz as an octave. We hear that at about the same amount of change. We hear a change from 120 hertz to 240 hertz as an octave too, about the same amount of change. But how many hertz are in between here on that one? What's the difference between 120 and 240? One, 120. It is double. That's how our ears hear it. But mathematically, it's 120 uh, uh, degrees or 120 different uh, hertz in between there. And there's only 60 between this one. When we go from 1,000 hertz up to 1,240 hertz, it's still going up 120. But our ear will barely hear that difference. That won't mean much to us. Because our ear wants to hear doublings. Our ears in amplitude want to hear 10 times to be twice as loud. In, in frequency, we want to hear two times before we start to notice it, okay? we'll, before it starts to pop out. If an octave is a doubling of our frequency, and we start at 20 hertz and we end at 20,000, how many octaves can we hear? Would anyone like me to step through? Uh, it's going to be more than that. So if we start at 20 hertz, what's the octave above 20 hertz? Good. So there's how many octaves? One. It's moved up one octave. OK. What's the next octave going to be? Good. OK. 160, right? Next one. Six forty. Next one. Twelve eighty, and I'm just going to put that to twelve fifty. Okay, just to make life easier here. Double that one. Twenty five hundred. Double that one. Double that one. And double that one. And we're done. That makes sense. Four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten octaves. We can hear ten octaves. What's that? I have no idea what you guys are talking about. Okay. And our ears hear that difference between 80 and 160 hertz, which is an 80 hertz difference, the same as we hear the difference between 2,500 and 5,000 hertz, which is actually a 2,500 hertz difference. We hear that, and this is the same. Our ears work on doubling frequencies. Weird, right? I know. This is our most mathematical day, by the way. Any questions at this point that you want me to answer? Before we move on to these miserable Fletcher Munson curves. OK. Well, life can't be this easy, can it? We can't just have mathematics, and now we have to deal with the brain doing its weird thing on the universe. Whenever I draw that, that is going to be the uh, audio window. So you're always going to know amplitude frequency, right? And uh, so if we have the frequencies going across there, and we produce a sound like this, that is, we'll say that's at 90 decibels, OK? Our ear will hear, let's say, 60, 600, 6,000. 
we will hear that 60 hertz at 90 decibels. We will hear uh, the um, 600 hertz at 90 decibels, and we'll hear the 6,000 hertz at 90 decibels. Okay. Now I take and play that same sound at only 30 decibels. Much quieter, much quieter, right? Uh, six, there's a difference between nine and three is six, so it's actually one, ten, one, one, two, three, four, five, six. The sound is a million times quieter. <laughs> Crazy to think about, right? Our ear will now not hear the bass as loud as the mid-range and the high. It will sound to us like the bass is really low here, and then it comes up. Even though if we took out my handy dandy uh, phone app here, it would tell me, yeah, the bass frequency is playing at 30 hertz. I wouldn't hear it as 30 hertz. I'd hear it at a very small amount, low level. We don't hear low frequencies well at low amplitudes. Can someone say that back to me, what I just said? Low amplitudes. What does that mean when we're mixing at low amplitudes? What's going to happen or what do we need to consider? The speaker will produce it. The speaker will. We can't hear it. So what's going to happen when you're mixing bass at low levels? You can't hear it, so what are you going to do? Uh, you're not going to be able to feel it. Well, you're going to make it louder, aren't you? And you're going to mix your bass too high if you're mi mixing at low levels. you got to bring everything else down, or you got to artificially bring the bass up. And so, if you've ever, have, has anyone seen the loudness button on a stereo? No. This used to be a very popular thing back in the day. You press this loudness button, and what would it do? It would put in an EQ that would artificially boost the bass level there so that our ear would hear it here. That's what the loudness button did. Yeah, yeah, they're on the old school cassette player. I don't know why they went away, but. No. Like that loudness thing, it does like make noise like the speaker sucks. Yeah. So that's why when you do that, like you hear the bass, but like it doesn't like vibrate as much. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Uh, that's because what it what what it's doing there is it's producing a lot of overtones and the bass note doesn't actually exist. When we talk on a telephone, there are no low frequencies there. Our ears hear the overtones and will mimic uh will will fill in the idea of the fundamental tone coming underneath. That's a little bit different than what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is if you're going to monitor at a low level, you are either going to mix your bass too loud because you can't hear it, or you're going to have to find a way to compensate by boosting the bass up so that it sounds like it's the same level as here. Is that clear? Uh, as this moves up, as I, as I increase the level, it gets more flat, and our hearing response is more flat at high levels. Our hearing is more sensitive in this range, especially at low levels. Fletcher Munson curves look like this. This will confuse you. Uh, but what this is saying is, how much do you have to boost the bass when the sound is that quiet? If I'm going to listen to up here at 6K, I'm going to listen to a sound at 15 decibels. I need to increase at 60 hertz. I need to increase the EQ by 45 decibels, right? Yes? Well, the sweet spot is as loud as possible, which causes hearing damage. <laughs> so the sweet spot is all of these. It's sort of the same thing as I was talking about headphones, right? Uh, what will happen is you'll start mixing your song to the Fletcher Munson curves rather than what's reality. So you have to keep adjusting for the Fletcher Munson curve. You have to listen loud, you have to listen quiet. Or you have to know your speakers and your listening environment and your ears so well that you know the bass needs to be pretty quiet when I'm listening to this at a comfortable level. Because when someone cranks this up, that bass is going to come punch punching through. Our ears are more sensitive to mid-high frequencies, especially at low levels. Why is that? 
it's when we're walking around in the jungle and the wife yells at us to not do that stupid thing we're about to do, right? Uh, high pitch, stop! Sound will cut through. Literally, that's what's going on. The other, pe the other people who may, uh, and guys make that sound, not as much, right? Our voices don't tend to quite get as high uh, in this range, in that really sensitive range. Uh, babies, a you know, screaming baby is going to get your attention and probably stop you from doing whatever you're doing, right? And it kept us alive long enough to reproduce, and here we are. Here we are, okay? Our ears are perfectly tuned for the sounds our mouths make. That's what they're designed for, to hear really well. And most of the human speech is right in this area. And if you want to be piercing and loud and get someone's attention, it's right there. Right there at three to, three to six to eight kilohertz, okay? And that's uh, when we listen to rock and roll and we hear uh, Robert Plant screaming real high up there. His voice is pushing a lot of these high frequencies. It's very, jumps out. Piercing through the song. Yeah? So this looks... I'm saying right here, the red line is what we'd hear. Okay. The red line is what we... The blue is what is. This, the solid blue is what is. The red line is what we would hear. So we would have to boost the blue up that much to make it sound like this dotted red line. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the reason I had to do that is because that's the way the Fletcher Munson's curves look. Think of this as how much you have to boost that frequency to make it sound the same. So if I, if I have this frequency here at this range, I need to boost it by this much when I get to the low. I wish these curves were upside down. I wish it would just say, I, can, I can't hear it as well down here. I can hear it better up here. They seem upside down to me. Yes, flipped. If you're thinking that, then you're seeing it right. It is, it is. How much would you have to increase your EQ for it to sound level, flat? Okay, how much do you have to increase your EQ? Um, if you're ever on an airplane or you're ever around a uh, place where you've put in um, uh, head or earplugs, right? It's great. You get on the airplane, put that in, and the jet noise is quiet and all that stuff, and then a baby starts crying. And what you've done is just filtered out all the sound around here, except for right here where that baby's crying. And in some ways, the baby can sound louder because that noise is coming right. You'd, you'd only need to hear 20 decibels of that baby. And it's like, oh, yeah, I hear that. Catching it. Yeah. Kept us alive. Kept us alive. How are we doing? Good? We are just about, uh, just got these uh, last three things that I want to talk to you, and then we'll, we'll take a pause. Localization. So our hearing is actually pretty fantastic. We can hear 10 octaves. We can only see one octave. It goes from red, we get to ultraviolet, it starts to go back to red again. Uh, there, would be an, there is another red above ultraviolet, something we would call red, except we can't see it. Our eyes don't respond to it. Wish we could. It'd be cool to see different colors of red. Just like we hear different C's as different octaves. C1, C2, C3, C4. Okay. Uh, we don't hear as high frequencies as like bats uh, or some dogs uh, and stuff. But we actually have a really good range. Um, there's some that are more than us, but we are... Uh, where is human? You guys see human here? Uh, yeah. There we are. Yeah, they're purple. Yeah, see, we're not, we're right there with all of our mammalian friends, right? Uh, we have, uh, it looks like ferrets, man, have a pretty long range, right? So, uh, when you look at, uh, where's, where's dog? Dog there? Dogs and humans are about the same. Dogs can't hear as low frequencies, they can hear higher frequencies. Dogs don't have better hearing than us, okay? They don't have better, better hearing than us. Um, they can hear higher frequencies than us. Okay. Right. They don't like. They don't even hear the bass. Poor dogs. Okay. When they, there was a dog hit that came out, it was all about that trouble. Sorry. Uh, tuna. Yeah, tuna don't hear very well at all. Okay. Uh, dolphin. Well, I see porpoise down here. Because we have we the two our tools can measure it. Our tools can measure it. There's, there's 
yeah, there's frequencies going on that we can't, we can, we can measure in tools. What's, what's black? Huh? What the black means here? I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, some of those bats are getting way up there, right? Yeah, little brown bats, really high frequencies, right? Okay. So don't let anyone tell you that you can't hear. We, you know, you stand up for your rights as a species. Um, uh, and um, actually, uh, um, I wonder, uh, so that was frequency range. Um, it's hard to find amplitude. No. So they don't show it. I, I, I've never seen one in amplitude. They've always talked about that. But we can hear a tremendous amplitude. I'm assuming many of our mammalian friends are in the sim similar range, right? Um, where we really start to shine and we step apart as a species, uh, us and cats are particularly good at it, is localization. And if you've ever had a dog, uh, you probably have noticed sometimes that a sound will come from over there and you'll go look at it and your dog will go, huh? 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 <laughs> trying to find it. And they have to start sniffing around and looking and moving their head until they can localize where the sound comes from. And you're like, uh, it was right there, dude. Uh, why is that? Well, we uh, have this big unit in between our ears that provides a couple different things for us. Our skull. Yeah, first of all, we have a brain. Okay? <laughs> And uh, the bra that skull does a couple things for us. One is it separates our ears. I actually was overhearing a dog and a cat talking the other week, and they were talking about us, and they were like, you know, they're stupid far ears. Their ears are far apart. Uh, they tease us when we're not listening, those animals. But uh, yes, our ears are far apart, okay? Makes us goofy looking to, to some, I suppose. But it provides a couple of nice features. One is... When I make a sound over here, it is louder in this ear than this ear. That make sense? If I make a sound that is, my ears are six inches apart, and I make a sound six inches away from this ear, how much louder is it in this ear than this one? We're gonna, we're, we're, what's that? We're gonna get this. Six inches from this ear, which means it's a foot from this ear. It's twice as far, so how much quieter is it? Four. Good. Four times quieter. One fourth. Am I going to keep hit? I'm going to hit you guys with this all yeah. semester. It's because when yeah. you talk about like the, like squaring it, and then you're talking about, it's like that's why. You step one, you have to, step one, you have to find what's the difference. What's, what's the ratio in distance? One is X times further. Then you square that. So if this is six inches, and this is another six inches, this is twice as far away, so it's one fourth as loud. Okay. So that's that's one of the big differences. I happen to know my beagle. Uh, he used to love me to rub his ears, and then I would put my fingers further in, and he loved it more and more. And I kept putting my fingers in, and my fingers were about that far apart when I was still in his ear. And I'm like, somewhere in there's a brain, uh, but there's not much of one, right? His ears were only about that far apart, which means that that intensity difference between those two wouldn't have been that much. Harder for him to localize. Okay? His ears were more about wafting up sound so he could sniff, right? He could sniff. Spectral localization. Second thing that happens uh, is that when a sound comes from this side, and let's say it's a high frequency, does anyone remember how long the wavelength is for 1K? How long is the wavelength of 1K sound? This one, this one is, I want you to memorize this. One foot, good job. 1K is one foot, okay? So a uh, 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 1K sound is one foot. Uh, so how long is a 2K sound? You're gonna get this. You're gonna get this by the end of the semester. Huh? Twice the frequency. Oh. As frequency goes up, what happens to wavelength? There we go. So how long is it? 
Half a foot. Six inches. 2K is half foot, right? Or six inches. All right. So if I'm in the, in, in, if I'm in the ocean and there are some big, huge waves coming, and I put up a little pole here, what's going to happen when those waves get to that pole? Big, huge waves coming across the ocean here. <coughs> They're going to splash that pole. What's most of the wave going to do? It's going to go right around it. right? This little pole is not going to stop a big wave. It's just going to wrap around it, right? The big sound waves that come from the right on me, the base goes right around my head, just like the wave in the ocean would, and goes in this ear. It does it, it does it a little bit later, right? Uh, oops, sorry, I, I didn't mean to say late. It's a little bit quieter on this side, but it's wrapping right around my head like it's not there. Okay. Now, what about if I put a little slightly larger thing and I have a little ripplet coming, a small wave, and it hits a barrier? What's that small wave going to do? Disperse. It's going to disperse. It's going to bounce off it, reflect, right? So in high frequency wave waves, remember, 2K is only six inches, 4K would be how long? Three inches. 8K would be how long? OK, so let's pretend this little 8.8K sound wave is coming from my right right now. It is only a foot and a, an inch and a half across. It's this wide. And it hits my head. What's it going to do? It's going to, not my ear. Hopefully, it doesn't go in my head. It's going to bounce off it. Some of it will get absorbed by my skin or my hair, right? But most of it will kind of go boink and bounce off and uh, scatter, like you talked about with the ocean wave, right? While at 50 hertz, or uh, let's say 125 hertz, when my wave is 8 feet, an 8 foot wave, imagine an ocean wave hitting my head and something was holding my head so it didn't break my neck, an 8 foot wave would just go right around my head, wouldn't it? Like it wasn't even there. Okay? And that's what that sound wave does. It goes right around your head and goes in. And so what happens is our head filters out the high frequencies. And if something on the left, this side will have a lower frequency, uh, uh, it'll be like a high cut filter being on the sound on this side of my head than this side. Just because those waves can't get around it. Does that make sense? They bounce off instead. That's called spectral localization. So now there's the sound. Uh, louder here, it also has more high frequency information in it. You can take two sounds in your speaker, your headphones, and if you uh, put on a high cut filter on one side, it'll sound like the sound is coming from the other side. Even though everything else is the same except for the high frequency. Sound good? Thirdly, and I want you to know these things by the way, Haas, precedent, it gets to this side before it gets to this side. It gets to this side before it gets to this side. Okay. If, I feel like we're doing so much math today. This is very exciting. Do you remember how long a millisecond is? Thousandth of a second. Thousandth of a second. It's always confusing, right? I know. Yeah, it should be a millionth of a second, but it's a thousandth of a second. Okay? 0 0.001 seconds. Uh, Guess how far sound, did I tell you how far sound goes in a millisecond? Well, I will. One foot equals one millisecond. Nice, kind of easy things to remember. Okay? So it takes one millisecond for sound to go. If the room is 20 feet across, how long does it take the sound to get across there? 20 milliseconds. Okay? Because the sound, if the room is 20 feet across and the sound goes and bounces off the wall and comes back to me, how long does it take? 40 milliseconds, right? 20 feet plus 20 feet. Okay? How much louder is the sound at the back wall than it is at me when it bounces back? <laughs> no? It's one fourth. It's twice as, this is twice as far, which means you have to square it, right? It goes two times as far, so it's one quarter as loud. Inverse square law. That's the one to bring up the party. You can just start quizzing people on the inverse square law. They will definitely leave you alone. Okay. So if my head is six inches across, how much later does the sound get to this ear than this ear? Half a millisecond, right? 
So this is called the Haas effect. H A A S. Haas. He was uh, probably uh, related to Fletcher and Munson. Uh, the Germans were the you know first uh, audio people. They were way ahead of us in audio in the 30s and 40s. Haas, that's is good. Haas is good. Uh, you can mimic this if you put on uh, two identical sounds on a computer or your headphones, and you put a little sample delay in there of a, of a millisecond. All of a sudden, it'll sound like the sound is all coming from the right side. It will really, in fact, the Haas might be our strongest one, because I can have a sound much louder on this side than this side. If this one comes first, I'm going to hear this one as the first one, and that, that I'm going to hear this as the source. If you're in speakers and you listen to speakers and you move your head just six inches to the side, all the sound will go boom and be coming from that speaker. You won't even hear that speaker. Why is that? Well, it's about how our, our brain is putting sounds together. Uh, where Irene is, when she talks, she hears my direct voice very quickly, right? Alex, way in the back, he hears more reverb than my direct voice. He's in the reverberant field. Remember that? But my, the shortest path to him is still my direct sound. So he has a little bit of my direct sound coming. His brain takes all that reverberant sound and says, ah, because that came after, even though it's louder, because that came after, Nate was making that sound, and I can echolocate him. I can echolocate him. Okay. So Haas effect is really important for, a couple, for many different things. One of them is where you are in relationship to your speakers. You move a little off center, and suddenly you're mixing all your sound way over in this other speaker. Uh, it's really important on microphones. If you're going to set up a stereo mic situation, and a mic is getting to one sound first before the other, it's going to sound like it's coming only from that mic. Make sense? Haas effect. So in order to account for Haas effect, we want to be in the median plane, which is equal distance between the two speakers. And at that point, we will be listening to the phantom image. And the phantom image is where we hear sound coming from when it's not. When you put headphones on, you have a speaker here and a speaker here. And you swear to god that sound is coming from the middle of your brain. But it is not. There is not a speaker in the middle of your brain. That's called the phantom image. Same with two stereo speakers. They're up like this. You'll hear the sound coming from the middle, but it's not. And we all don't even think about it, but now when you do think about it, it's weird. You really think the sound's coming from somewhere where it's not coming from. Okay. Last thing uh, is important, masking. And masking means two sounds at a similar frequency that cover each other up and cause problems. We want to avoid it. Any questions? Because we've covered masking quite a bit. Great, I'm going to pause that lecture. Did I get under